Um, and uh, we already know how to do that pretty much. We're gonna type, say print, and we'll see the thing on the next line. Here's something interesting. I just did get status, and we saw some stuff in color. Uh, here's something else interesting. I just used ls, and I should mention for this presentation, if you've got a computer uh, with you, and you can get to a you know, Unix-style terminal, um, there's some stuff you can try interactively. And one of the things you should try is ls here. Because uh, you'll see that as you change the size of your terminal emulator window, um, the output of ls changes. It dynamically decides how many columns of output to use based on the size of your terminal. Uh, so there's another kind of mystery that we'd like to solve today. Um, how to do color, how to do ls so that it's doing different things differently. Also, ls gives you different output if you're piping it versus if you're looking at it interactively. So those are some of the things that we'd like to learn how to do. Um, here's some other ways that we use our terminals. You've got top here, which is filling up the whole screen. And maybe we could know how to do that by printing a bunch of text really quickly and then waiting and then printing it again. But that's not what's happening because as we see when we quit, it all goes away. So there's something else going on here. That's, there's a, a third or fourth mystery if you're keeping count. That's how many. Um, another thing is, is once we know how to, say, build up an interface like this, we're going to be able to do stuff like, oh, I, I just went too quickly. Uh, we're going to be able to do things like build a fully windowed system. We can build basically graphical user interface applications. We're gonna call them text user interfaces. This is PUDB. It's the debugger that I like to use. It's kind of a nice interface over PDB. Um, and you can, you can imagine, you have a lot of opportunities open to you. As soon as you want a user interface, you don't have to jump to QT. You don't have to go to the web. You could use something like this. Um, and even if you take nothing else from this talk, this is a great debugger, you should, you should use it. All right, what are terminals? What, what I mean by this is when I say the word terminal, um, I'm talking about this thing. Uh, you can see I've even got the little Mac thing there. That's sort of important because this is only gonna be relevant to Unix terminals. Portions of this are relevant to Windows things, but I'm not gonna, I don't know how much, and I'm not gonna go into how much. Um, I mean a terminal emulator. And we say emulator because the thing that we're emulating is these things, video terminals. Um, but, a video terminal was already emulating something else, and that was originally a teletype machine, maybe a, an electronic typewriter that sends signals. Um, these have been around for about 100 years. We've had these for a long time. Maybe we had a typewriter, and you could change it so that it sent signals. Um, I'm gonna read a little bit of text from an ad from 1957. This was the uh, 50th anniversary year of the teletype corporation. Let's see. A teletype printer is a communications device with a keyboard similar to a typewriter that enables you to send and receive printed messages. So this is, this is copy for maybe a, a business person in the, in the 50s to figure out that they wanted one of these things. They say things like, with it you can send, written, written word can be sent instantaneously by wire within the office or plant or clear across the country to a single destination or many at a time. So we're starting with this model of a terminal as basically a typewriter where it's not connected to anything. Your finger hits a key that causes the, you know, the arm actuator thing to hit, to put ink on paper. That's our beginner. But then we add the teletype part where we're sending a signal over a metal wire to an application. Maybe that's a telegraph operator somewhere else in another part of the country. Maybe that's a computer program. And then maybe we send, send signals back somehow. I don't know, there's maybe some metal wire involved, signal processing or something. Um, so let's look at a modernized version. We're gonna say we have these system calls like f read to return bytes. Uh, we have f, f write, which is gonna print things. And now, because we're using a terminal emulator, there's some GUI stuff that happens that we're not gonna get into to get this stuff to the screen and still key presses, right, go to the terminal. Because this is a Python talk, we're gonna talk about print and input instead. This is a Python 3 talk, so input means the raw input in Python 2. The first thing we should look at is what bytes we can write to a terminal and what happens when we write them. Um, so I've kind of grayed out, you can tell some of the reading portions there. Well, what bytes can we send? First off, we can send ASCII bytes. Uh, this is kind of boring for the most part. There, we have literals. Um, in Python 3 here, you can say, sys.standardout.buffer.write dot dot right, and then send some bytes. Those will end up at your terminal. You can try this now if you want. Um, and then we also have control characters that we can send. Um, these are like the really small ASCII bytes. Um, all right, well, let's give this a shot here. Say that I was going to you know, try this here, import, whoops, import sys, and we're gonna do sys.standout.buffer.write, 
We could write some byte string here. Um, but this is gonna be a little confusing to look at because we've got a return value down here. So I'm gonna do something a little bit different. And you can do this too, if you've got a computer there. Um, I'm gonna run a server over here that's just listening for bytes. So we're not gonna see the input and output interleave. And then over here, we're gonna do um, import socket. That's the old socket.socket. S dot, what we connect to this thing. And let's send some bytes. Great. All right, so now we can tell that when we send ASCII bytes, we get simple things like this. We're just sending them over. Here's our ASCII table. We're looking right now at the ones on the right, kind of boring, but there's all this other stuff that, and remember, this all makes sense in the context of a typewriter. ASCII things are, this is, this is typewriter times. So what do these do? Let's look at it, let's try a few of them now. Um, one we could try that you'll probably know what's gonna happen here is that's that send, what happens if we write a new line? Guesses as to what's gonna happen there. This is one you should be able to predict because we write new lines all the time. Uh, the cursor went down to the next line, okay? You can sort of imagine that's what would have happened. Um, let's try something else here. We're gonna write now a um, backslash B. Ideas of what's gonna happen here. Anyone's used this one? Look, you look, the cursor is moving backwards. Um, so this is a thing that sort of makes sense on a typewriter. You could move it back and forth, and now we could do something like overwrite that with a space. So you could see how we could implement maybe a backspace thing. Um, maybe we could also do a carriage return, which means move the carriage of the typewriter back to where it started. And that moves the cursor over here. So we've just unlocked the power, uh, well, the ability to rewrite a line, and what that lets us do is progress bars. So here's a program that has a progress bar. We can now do this just with this knowledge of being able to write a carriage return to rewrite the current line. How would we go about doing that? In Python, we might do something like this. Um, just the general shape of the code. The important parts here are, let's see, that we're flushing. So there's some buffering going on that we'll look at a little bit later, but it may be important to flush if you're not writing a new line. Um, we're writing a standard error. Also, we're not writing byte strings anymore. This is still Python 3, but now we're writing, uh, or I, I hope this is Python 3, but now we're writing um, uh, Unicode strings. And we'll get in a little bit to how that works. But this code would work perfectly well for progress bars. So now you can add progress bars to your interactive tools. Who writes command line tools that someone might run in a terminal sometime, right? All, we need utilities for this all the time. It can be fun to add some of these features to them. Um, Look at what else we've got. All right, so we can do terminal encoding. Um, say that we're, terminals generally have an encoding. Um, in fact, they had it the whole time, but the ASCII stuff overlaps because it was UTF-8. If you try this, I won't try it now, but this gives us an NEA. And then we can just say sys.standardout.write if we're using Unicode strings because Python will take care of the encoding for us. Um, now let's talk about some things that don't make sense on typewriters. Um, these only really make sense on these video terminals. Uh, these are ANSI escape sequences. Uh, before we look at them, let's try one here. Um, I'm gonna write slash x1b. If you're not familiar with this syntax, this is a way of specifying a byte that doesn't have a nice printable representation. Um, open 33m, oh, it doesn't look like anything happened. All right, so the lesson here, well, we don't have a lesson yet. Lesson we're about to learn is that terminals have state. So when I sent those bytes, it said, oh, I'm gonna start writing in yellow now. And then when I sent more bytes, we're still stuck in this yellow mode. So this is the kind of thing that, you know, it's good to know that the way you signal this to the terminal is you send it some special bytes, and some of the bytes don't mean put characters on the screen, they mean change your state for future invocations. Let's look at some of the other kinds of things we could do here. Um, these, you know, the word ANSI implies there's some standardization that happened here, right? Um, we can move the cursor around the screen. We can clear the entire screen. We can hide the cursor so that you could print things without seeing where the cursor is writing right now. Start writing in bold, start writing in red. Um, so there's a lot of this, and you can just start playing with this now. I, a great Wikipedia page is the one on ANSI escape sequences, which describes, hey, here's how to write in red. Here's how to write in blue. Here's how to make something bold. Um, so now, look at a little parable. Um, say it's, it's 19, we started this, so it, it's uh, the year is 1984. You can do this live, I think he has it up right now. Um, 
and you log into some kind of BBS system or some, you tell net somewhere and it starts sending you sequences and it's really cool. I, maybe you're 12 and you think it's really cool or maybe you're 40 and you think it's really cool. Um, but unfortunately on your friend's you know, terminal, these show up correctly, but on yours they don't quite show up right. So this is the kind of first iteration of, who, who uses JavaScript sometimes? Well, but who uses jQuery? So there's this thing called jQuery in JavaScript that became popular for, in this abridged history that I'm telling, um, kind of two main reasons. One, it papered over differences in browsers, and this was huge, right? There were browser incompatibilities, so we had that same problem with terminals. Um, different terminals behaved differently. We still have this to some extent, um, but like jQuery, it's less necessary now because things are more standardized. People are more likely to be using the same kinds of terminals. Uh, the other reason I think jQuery became popular is it's a nice interface, and we're gonna look at some libraries in Python that similarly give you a better interface than the native one. Uh, so we have compatibility concerns I was talking about. Uh, the first things we did that were come up with databases of different terminals, how you do these different capabilities in different terminals. Um, term cap and then term info did this. Um, then we wrote an, a library for applications to use called purses that accesses these databases and lets you say, oh, I wanna draw a square and it will figure out how to do that and some kind of lower level things too. Um, on your machine, you can probably say man t put or do you try t put space and you have to know some magic sequences and that will kind of look up in that database how to make things red, how to move the cursor up. Um, and then another thing you can look at is info CMP was gonna dump like information about these mappings with your particular terminal setup. Here is an example. So, Something you can do if you don't want to learn the Python ways to do this, you can shell out and say, hey, I want to clear the screen, and that's maybe easier to learn, but we don't want to do that. You can do these kinds of things probably in Bash, or probably system commands you have, um, but instead we want to use blessings. Blessings is a wrapper over curses, which is the normal kind of interface that we use for accessing these databases of how to do a different thing in a different terminal, um, but it's much nicer. Um, here we're doing um, print this and thing in bold. Now the important thing to know about blessings is that mostly it just gives you strings. So t dot bold of high there is gonna be a string and it's still your job to print that string, but it's gonna be built for you so you don't have to type in those escape sequences. Uh, right, so let's solve the full screen mystery with blessings. So we saw before that using top, uh, the entire screen was taken up, we could write things and then it all went away. So one more of these, let's try from blessings import terminal. We build one of these things which looks at our settings. Um, whoops. This looks at our settings and figures out, oh, you have this kind of terminal looking at the environmental variable term. And then we can say something like, uh, we're, what we're gonna send here is t dot, uh, let's do enter, enter full screen and then we're gonna encode that for our terminal. And now we're back in that full screen thing. You can see it kept the current line and there's some, some differences in how different terminals do this. Um, but now we can write stuff and then we could send our exit and we're back into our original one. All right, so these are some of the kinds of things we can do by writing bytes to the terminal. So this is just knowing the language to speak. It's kind of in, in in-band signaling, where we send bytes, some of the bytes don't result on things being on the screen. Uh, high cursor, alternate screen, you can read them for yourself. Um, and you can read man pages that will tell you more about how these different ones work. All right, next let's talk about what happens when the user types at the keyboard. Um, you probably are familiar with, you can say raw input or input in Python, and it's gonna wait until the user types a whole line of text and then hits enter. Um, so how does that, how does that kind of work? Um, first off, there's this thing called the line discipline, which describes when you hit what keys, what it's gonna do, when these bytes become available to the application from a read call. Um, you can kind of play with, see you know, how this is implemented in the kernel, and you can see how they're implemented by playing with, try, if you type cat, and then type some stuff, you'll see that you don't have control A, you don't have control E, as your kind of Emacs style read line shortcuts. Um, all that you have is kind of reprint, I guess we list them here, backspace, delete word, reprint, delete line, um, and th the application can't get the, what the contents of that buffer until you hit enter. 
Um, and then there are a lot of other terminal settings. This is, we'll kind of look up, one that we're gonna use as an example is echoing. So normally, right, when, to go back to our typewriter analogy, if you have a typewriter, your finger hits the key, ink goes to the paper right now, and then a signal is sent, and then maybe on this maybe copper line, it comes back and the typewriter could do something else. But it's always gonna hit there, right? Hitting the key, the act of hitting the key causes ink to go to paper. So it doesn't make sense. I mean, that's where this echoing thing comes from, but we're not stuck with that anymore with our video terminals. Um, and the way we're gonna do this is we have this other interface, this out of band signaling, um, where I've said kind of get and set here. We can get and set these different attributes about the terminal and say, you know what, I don't actually want you to, to every time you hit a key, show that. Um, so let's look at those here. Again, the relevant man pages are probably the best place to read exactly about how to do this, but we're just gonna skip that and talk in detail about echoing. STTY minus echo turns off echo. So this is a command line program you probably have. Um, and then you can write echoes turned off. We can try this real quick. Oh, now I can type, but you can't see it. Uh-oh. Um, and then we can STTY echo, and we're back. When your terminal's in a weird state, you probably wanna type reset like this, if it doesn't help. So who's, who's catted a, a binary file or somehow your terminal gets into a pretty weird state, they're a weird font maybe, um, it, it gets messed up and you're like, shoot, what am I gonna do? Okay, so you wanna type reset and then when that doesn't work, you probably wanna type it again because there was something already in the buffer that made it so you, what you actually typed was blah, 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 reset. Um, so that's, that's the other big hint from this, type reset twice, that, I feel like that saves me a lot. Um, so we can turn back on echo here. Let's do it in Python though, we wanna be using Python. There's get pass in the standard library, which uses this, so let's look at the source for get pass and see how that works. Um, I'd mostly, so this is real code from the Python standard library. Um, I would worry about just the shape of this generally. Term iOS TC get adder is the, the thing that we're saying, like, hey, show me the status of all those knobs, and then you do some bitmask stuff, and you say set the knobs in these ways. I'm, I'm just calling them knobs, because imagine we have our video terminal right here, maybe there's a knob on it, and it comes through and says, hey, please set your terminal in this mode, and you say, oh, okay, I'll, I'll do that. That's kind of what we're doing here. Um, and then really important, we have the try finally. Um, so the terminal is a resource external to your program. So if you don't wanna mess it up in that way that, that happens to us all the time, um, then you should be careful about, you know, you wouldn't have an, ha wanna have an error without, and then not clean up after yourself, and then not restore the terminal to that echo state. And that's when you have to type reset. So we wanna do this, but it's Python, so this would be a good fit for a context manager. Uh, in fact, we'll look at some libraries that do provide these kinds of context managers, but the sort of thing we wanna do is say, oh, I wanna modify standard in, I wanna change it in these ways, um, and then once we're done, I wanna undo those changes. Here's using that context manager. All right, so here are the kinds of things that we can do by setting these knobs. I'm not gonna go into exactly what they are because we're gonna use libraries that paper over them, but if you know that these things are possible, you can look up how to do them. Um, turn off echo, send keys immediately, I'm just reading again. OS dot is addy, oh this is great, this is, does it look like a TTY? Um, is the thing that you're wired up to a terminal, an interactive one? And that's how LS is saying, oh should I display things in columns based on the width of the screen or should I be just putting them out because you're piping this to grep and you want each thing on a different line. Um, and it's your responsibility if you start doing these fancy terminal things to make sure that your program still works well with piping if it's supposed to, and probably should. Um, if it doesn't, then you get in the situation where you have a program that only works interactively, and now someone else has to try to use it in a script. And the way, there are ways to do that, we'll look at it in a sec, but it'd be nice if you can just work, check to see if you should be doing fancy formatting or not with this is a TTY call. What else do we have? So we have echoing characters. Okay, mapping bytes to keys. So again, you can do this with cat. If you type cat, enter, and then use your arrow keys, you'll see that, first of all, your arrow keys don't work, but secondly, that several bytes are being written there. Um, so there's this mapping of bytes. If you hit A, yeah, it's gonna be A. But if you hit F11, you get something funny. If you do shift tab, you have something. So if you're writing a program that's supposed to interpret these, it's your job to figure out how to deal with this. Um, and again, there are libraries you should probably use, but it can be helpful to, to see that this is what's happening. Um, what changed there? Nothing. Um, byte sent without being typed. This is a, we'll, we'll 
look at this quickly. This is a fun exercise where do you really understand how your terminal's kind of working. We're gonna write some bytes to our, you can try this now. Um, we're gonna write these bytes to our terminal and what the terminal's gonna do in response to this is write some bytes on standard in that we're supposed to read, figure out they didn't come from the user, they're a response to our query and interpret. Um, and this doesn't really make sense if you're in that buffered, you know, only make the data available to the application when they hit enter mode, you should be in C break or one of these other modes we'll talk about in a sec. Um, but if you try this now, you'll probably get something like this, and that prompt's there on purpose. On the prompt, it, there will be characters, because they've been written on standard in. Um, and it, it's just funny to think about that a program could write to standard in, or that you could end up with characters there that appear in your buffer like this. Um, and what it's really trying to say is like, this is a cursor query, um, it's saying where is the cursor on the screen? And you don't need this for much, but occasionally you do um, when you're doing interesting resizing things. Uh, briefly signals, this is just another thing that we can get in set, we can say, hey, you know what, when I do control C, I don't want that to cause a signal that will you know, cause a signal handler to run and I have to set that up. I would rather have this other thing happen. I just want the control C, let me figure it out. Some of the signals we can get, um, sig inf, control C, uh, TSDP is the suspend thing, winch is for there's a window change, and the thing to know about this are these three different modes, cooked, raw, and C break. Cooked is the normal terminal mode we're in, it's line buffered, echo is on. These are groups of different settings that you might wanna use if you're writing a, a interactive program. Um, raw is this mode where all the signal handlers are turned off, I, maybe all, I think all, um, and hitting keys just passes those keys immediately directly to your program. So you could say read and you would get them immediately. And then C break is a hybrid where you still have the signal handling. This is probably what you wanna use because you still want the user to be able to you know, break out of the program with control C, but you, you get the keys right away. All right, so now we're gonna go through some of these, or right, so we'll do questions later, but these are what I've found useful, some tools that are useful for this, how we should actually be doing this. Because I think it's fun to experiment with the actual codes, but then once you know that, you, you should be using some library on top of it instead. Um, the first off is blessings that Eric Rose wrote. Um, we looked at it earlier. You wanna be using, this is basically, this is the library to use, a nice wrapper over curses that lets you say things like, as you'll see here, write this in bold, um, move the cursor over here, write this text. But there's some cooler stuff that's in Blessed, which is a fork of Blessings by Jeff Quast, and it's almost merged, but it's been almost merged for about a year. So if you wanted to go play with this right now, I would use Blessed, and then hopefully in the next month or something, it'll, all the features will be merged back in. There's a branch on the Blessed, you know, on the GitHub for Blessings that has all these features. They've been refactored a little bit, or not refactored, they've been changed a little bit. But this lets you do cool stuff like the t.c break. So that puts us in C break mode, so our keys are available to us immediately. T.in key translates the bytes in the buffer into a key press with a pretty name, and we can say, ah, that was spacebar, ah, that was shift control T or something. And also some interesting formatting things. Anyway, Jeff did a great job. There's some really cool stuff in this, and if you just wanna play with this now, I would start with blessed, and then hopefully it'll be merged soon with blessings. Um, Irwid, that's how we were doing PUDB. Um, this is a, shoot, this is Ian, uh, I forget his last name now, um, that wrote this, and it's a widget library. It's like, if you want to be using your terminal for some kind of full screen application, this is probably what you want. It works like a GUI library. If you're familiar with Qt or something, it's gonna be kind of like that, or WX Python or something. Um, here, again, let's remind you that PUDB is cool. Well, it's gonna take too long. PUDB, the debugger we saw, is pretty cool. Um, some other tools that use this, Forgetting now, but there's some other ones that, that use it that are similar, pretty neat, right? You wanna write things like this, this is pretty cool. Clint and Click are two command line utility libraries, so if you're still writing this call and response style application, but you want a progress bar, but you wanna print something that is wide as the terminal. Um, you wanna have something in red, you wanna wait for a key, these are maybe the libraries you wanna use. I've not used these much, so I can't talk about them much, but I've heard buzz about both of them, that they were, they were good. Um, read line, if you want fancy editing on the command line, this is probably what you want. You don't wanna re-implement this from scratch. This gives you control A, control E. Um, I think in Python 3, 4 now, this is kind of enabled by default, is with the tab completion and things. Um, 
But if you want your own tab completion, you can use this. Um, and a lot of the times when people, I think, want to do fancy terminal stuff, they're thinking of the things they get for free with readline. So readline is a way to put in user space what usually happens in kernel space. Normally the kernel is in charge of buffering up these characters, letting you do a few things like deleting a word or deleting the line. But readline says, all right, I'm gonna see routine. I'm going to put us in C break mode so that we get those signals immediately. And then, you know, so I get a key and then it can say, oh, you did control A. I know that that means move the cursor back to the beginning of the line. Oh, you did control E, I'll, I'll modify it in this way. Um, so you're in user space while you're doing that stuff, and you can modify readline, and I've done a little bit of this, kind of forking readline to do interesting things with it, and it's kind of fun because lots of programs use it. Next up, okay, this is a program that I wrote, which I shouldn't spend too much time on, but we wrote it for bpython, um, which is the thing I had in the left tab before. Um, this is an older version where we're having a little demo of what keys you're pressing. Um, but similarly to Erwid, the idea is what if you had the whole terminal as a canvas and you just paint over it, except it's more of a hybrid where you still have you know, a call and response kind of thing, but you get to pop up windows over it. Or, but you get to, we're gonna do it in sec, you can rewind back. So we're gonna do control R in a sec. Here it comes. I guess we're getting lots of text first. But y you can do things, there we go. So we rewound back up. So these are things that don't make sense. You know, if you're doing this kind of thing, you can't be using readline anymore. You can't be, using the normal, like you need full control of the terminal. And I shouldn't spend too much time on this because Python prompt toolkit um, by Jonathan, someone or other, um, is much better, it's just better code, it's better than the library that I wrote. Um, I don't think we're gonna migrate bpython anytime soon, but this is great. And if you wanna do, there's some great interactive MySQL and um, Postgres interface library or interface tools that have been written with this. This is great for, I want a command line tool, but I want the pop-up auto completion, but I want an editor in my command line. And here's a, we'll look briefly at a demo of this. The cool thing that they're doing there is this full, you know, editing anywhere, kind of IPython style, well, I'm not sure how to describe it. I'll just wait for it to pop up here. So it pops up at what looks like an editor, but you're still in your terminal. Um, there's a OCaml REPL called UTOP that does some of this. Uh, the Julia REPL has some of these things. Um, but it's just nicer. This is a syntax error and it popped me back up to where the syntax error was. This is pretty cool, um, but I don't know a bunch about it. Okay, a concept we should be familiar with is a PTY. This is a pseudo terminal. Um, this is what you use when you run, want to run another program in such a way that it looks like it's using a terminal. Um, Probably you should be using a library over it. Called, okay, so a PTY lets you do kind of neat things like take the output of a program and re-render it. What we're doing here, this looks kind of like Python. It's a working Python interpreter, except that there's a case transformation thing going on every five seconds or something. It flips the case. So it's just, it's just kind of funny, but you could imagine kind of transforming the output of some program. So this is a, a pseudo terminal. This is also how terminal emulators are written. Um, and where I first saw this was people writing tools for assisted net hack play. So they're, they're, they're writing, they're playing a game um, and they're not gonna inter, you know, change the code for net hack at all. This is one of these roguelike overhead things. Um, but they want to modify the input and the output. So this can sit between you and some other program. Um, you probably wanna look at pexpect, which is a Python version of the expect program. For, this is for interacting with command line tools that want to be interactive. They want to have a, a user at the helm, but you want to script them, of course. Um, I, okay, a cool tool here. If you've got a computer open, you might try right now typing telnet space termcast IO. Um, Jesse didn't write the original termcast, but he wrote the Python versions, and this is a Python conference, so here, you should, you should check these out. He's written, this, this is the idea that because terminal sessions are just a series of bytes, you could beam those bytes to everybody. You could say, hey, check out these bytes. I guess we should try this now. Um, term cast, oh, what was it? Telnet, right? Um, all right, I think I'm not online. It's probably the problem, right? All right, so it's not, oh, thank you. Org, right? Termcast.org. All right, we'll skip this for now, but 
the, the gist is that you can see if someone else has a session and they're sending, oh, I sent this byte, I sent the byte that makes it red, I sent the byte that moved the cursor over here, you could just get those bytes and then replay them in your own terminal. And you have very high fidelity, kind of low bandwidth um, screencasting, basically, of just your terminal. Um, so I, I check this out. Also, you can, it's easy to broadcast your own terminal session if you mostly work in a terminal, or you could broadcast a Tmux session, or something like that. Um, and it, the more web-friendly version, or user-friendly version of this is, um, I've gotta remember how to pronounce it. Anybody? Askinema? There's, there's, there's a nice way to pronounce it that has the word cinema and ASCII in it and doesn't have ass and, and other words in it. <laughs> um, but this is a cool tool for recording a terminal session and then making it playable in a browser. Um, and finally, I'm gonna talk about a few ways that I've used um, interesting terminal things. Here's one where I'm using, I think this is a, a, maybe a common possible use for interesting escape sequences and formatting and things, which is formatting test failures. Um, this is one where we're doing it in BPython. We say like, hey, there's something funny, instead of any, it says armadillo, and we kind of highlight those. And if you do it in your own terminal, it also blinks, which is just kind of fun. Um, and then I have another program where I needed to um, test that the window resizing was working correctly. So there's a program called tmuxp, which lets you script tmux in Python. And I have some tests that open a tmux session and then tr try resizing the window and see if we're treating that correctly. Um, and this is, I just found that was the easiest terminal emulator that I, was scriptable. So you see it's running these tests, nah, not yet. It's gonna run the tests in a second. And we'll see a resizing tmux window to test to see if we're kind of correctly treating these things. And that's about it. I have some kind of further reading things. This is not posted anywhere yet, but I will let you know um, on Twitter when I finally have a blog post up that lists all these resources, or at least a version of the slides that's accessible. Um, thanks, that's it. I think we have you know, a few minutes for questions. Um. It's maybe not a good question, but uh, how does the syntax for the special uh, characters work? Like the slash x1 mm. b bracket? Sure, yeah, yeah. So the gist there is that when you have Python string representations, um, you can do stuff like, whoops, you can, there, there are multiple representations for a string. Um, where I guess we're gonna, are we in Python 3? So I guess these are gonna be like Unicode strings here. But if you say slash x61 uh, and then you say, a, uh, these are identical, slash x61. So slash x61 is a way of describing, in fact, maybe it's clear if we try ord, oops, yeah, but, ord uh, of This a. is, uh, you know, this is hex, right? Right, hex, exactly, like yeah, this is hex. Decimal, but uh, in those special characters, you had like uh, other letters, like one n, and n is it's not a hexadecimal digit, so what is it? Right, right, so it just when Python renders strings, um, some of them end up, so if I say slash x61, slash x02, some, oops, not word, um, sometimes it renders them, sometimes some letters have pretty renderings, like 61, some don't, or hex 61, and some don't, like 02. So it's in the Python wrapper code, where it says, ah, this one isn't, if we try printing it, um, then it's gonna just not print. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was doing well. <laughs> Valiant, right, we just don't see it because it's not a, a, like a printable thing. When you send that to a terminal, it doesn't do anything. Um, so th it's just a different way. It's just like you can put single quotes or double quotes around a string. It's a different way of describing the same literal. And then in the print method, it says, ah, does this one have a pretty representation or not? Is that? Uh, not exactly. Oh, sorry. Like I get that, but uh, you had those uh, special terminal characters, mm -hmm. like, you know, slash x1b bracket 1n something, and I don't know if that's Got it. Yeah. Okay, x so there's or what is it? Like, okay, how sure. do you read it? Because I, oh. I had problems with it because I have a setup, I have a Windows machine talking to a remote Linux. Within a t uh, 
through Tmax and through Midnight Commander, and I basically have problems with character encoding all the time. Like sure, so these kinds of things here? Yeah, what yeah. is that? So that is, I mean, the first one is an escape byte, so it's that, that rendered byte. The next one is a, a real open square bracket, then it's a real three, a real one, and then an M. So they really are those characters here. The difficult one to deal with, I think, is the, the first one, the escape character, which, and I have you know, similarly, similar setups where it's like, okay, I've got this thing, and then I've got Tmux, and then I'm SSH'd in somewhere. So you have to trace it through each level um, and hope it kind of passes it through. Uh, so, but th what we're looking at really is, so the start writing in red is one, two, three, four, five bytes, because the first one is the escape byte, and then it's a real open square bracket. And if you read the Wikipedia article on the ANSI escape sequences, it at least hand waves about it a little bit. It says, all right, when we have a sequence that's gonna be more than two bytes, uh, we use this longer escape thing. Instead of just an escape character, we use the open square bracket as well. So yeah, yeah the pass through is difficult. Yeah, I, I agree, I've had trouble with that as well, because you have to trace it at each level. Are you really getting those bytes? And they're not visible bytes, so you have to do it like to a file and then use something that can read those bytes. So. Okay, thanks. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Uh, when talking about the read line library, you mentioned uh, several key bindings like control A and mm -hmm. control E. Uh, what would be the um, authoritative source for all of those key bindings? Because I've, I've, like, you've seen, um, probably you've seen that there are support, there's support for that in macOS, but it's sort of, Sometimes it works, sometimes some of them don't. Uh, wh where would be the, the authoritative sure. source? Sure, uh, when I've looked for that, I've Googled for read line. I don't remember kind of what site it was, I, was, I was at. Um, so I've just Googled for read line shortcuts. Um, and I found one that looked kind of authoritative. And so I, we had to do this for bPython. We re-implemented all of read line, basically. And so I learned a lot of read line shortcuts. I didn't know about whatever it is, um, meta close bracket, is it? Or, or something, maybe it's meta slash that runs, copies down the previous word or something. There's a lot of these. Um, I only. Right, sure, yeah, yeah. So if it's using real read line, it, it might, I think it should, and it's looking at your dot input RC and things like that. Um, so I don't know, but I would blame whoever implemented that, whoever wrote that program, either they're not using read line correctly or they re-implemented it and only re-implemented some of the shortcuts. Do we still have time for one short question if someone has? Uh, hello? What was the name of that cool interactive Python Oh, that's exactly the question I was hoping to get. Yeah, this is called bPython. Um, oh, okay, that is bPython. Yeah, then. it's great. You should all check it out. <laughs> really good. Is, Look at is this. Is that available online? Or <laughs> Look at that, and then capitalize. How does that work? Oh, there's the docs. That's, isn't that great? Check this out. I can undo. Now A is not defined anymore. Wow. Yeah, you should you all check this out. This is great. I'll be sprinting on this, because um, I've just ignored some issues and pull requests that have come up. So at least on Saturday, I'll be looking at this a bit. And then there's, I think we have bite-sized bugs if anyone wants to kind of help contribute with this. All right, thank you. Great, thanks.